Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, we'll give it just a few minutes for everybody who's been waiting um, in queue to join tonight's fireside chat. So give us just a few seconds and then we will get started. Got a great lineup for you tonight. It's going to be some great conversations and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm watching the numbers grow rapidly as people are coming in to join us for the evening. So we'll give it just another minute or so and we'll get going. And as you all can see, Bob is joining us over my shoulder for the evening up there. So. All right, well, I'm going to get us rolling. There'll be a few people joining us as we go, but uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight for our third and final fireside chat as part of our Voices of the Wilderness, what we're calling our at home edition. And while we are sad that we have been unable to join our community in person this year, it obviously was prudent and the smart thing to do to not have a large number of people together in an indoor space. I think we all know what's going on around us in the world with the pandemic. Uh, but this has actually been a great thing for us to be able to enjoy and, um, and be joined by our full community from across Montana and honestly across the country. We've had people from Virginia, North Carolina, uh, all over the Pacific Northwest join us for this. And so it's, it's been a nice addition to be able to uh, have people join us from everywhere, not just those who live in the Flathead that normally come to this event when it's live. Like I said, tonight is our final fireside chat. Tonight is also the end of the Voices of the Wilderness event in general. Our auction uh, ends tonight at 9.30. So those of you who are bidding, uh, we expect a, pre a pretty quick run up here up till 9.30. Uh, as those silent auctions often go, there'll be uh, people fighting you for the wonderful art and adventure packages and and the incredible gear that we have this year. Thank you to all the artists, to all of the incredible gear companies and local adventure packages that have been donated to us really has made this an incredible event for us. And so thank you all for doing that. This also will end our raffle sales tonight. We're selling up to 400 tickets for a chance to win that Cocopelli pack raft. Um, and there are still a few left. So if you go to bmwf.org, you can find, click on the link, the banner at the top there. And that'll take you to either the auction or to the raffle. Uh, so be sure to take advantage of that opportunity tonight. Um, and uh, because that's going to end tonight at 930. We've had some great fireside chats. We kicked things off with John Fraley and his new book, Heroes of the Bob, and, and we're joined by Bill Workman and Smoke Elzer. That was just a wonderful conversation. Last week, Tim Manley and Bryce Andrews joined us to talk about bears in the Bob and bears outside the Bob, of course. Uh, and then this incredible lineup tonight to talk about the history of this landscape that we all love so much. I did want to update everybody on the year we had. Uh, it was obviously challenging uh, this year with COVID, but we were able to get a lot of important work done in the complex for everybody this year. We were able to get some weeds work done, a lot of trail work done. Uh, we did have to shorten our volunteer portion of the schedule, but we were able to extend our paid staff uh, part of the year and get a lot of good projects done. Um, we hope we don't have to face another year like this, but we're also prepared to fight through any challenges that 2021 might have to throw at us. One thing that we cannot ever replace though is the incredible support of our community. You guys have been fantastic. This year has been uh, just great for us, our volunteers, our donors, our corporate sponsors, uh, those who support us through grant funding. We cannot thank you all enough. I also cannot thank the staff at the foundation enough. Rebecca, Allison, Meg, Sue, the incredible board of directors that have made this just such a, um, a great place to work, great team to be a part of. Um, it's just been a whole lot of fun and we're super excited um, to see what's ahead for us. Of course, we're here to talk about the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex or what we all affectionately call the Bob. But every time we talk about the Bob, we need to acknowledge the history of this land and that we are standing and working on the land of the Salish, Kootenai, and Blackfeet people. And we need to always recognize that fact. And we will get into that actually uh, quite a bit tonight. So it has been 80 years. It was 1940 when the Bob Marshall Wilderness was first administratively designated by the Forest Service um, shortly after Bob's death um, in 1939. And so we're going to try to go chronological, if you will, and follow an arc this evening and talk about of the history of this land, this incredible place, the, the, the centuries of stewardship of this land that has existed, not, not just with the foundation, but all peoples. Um, and we wanna start that conversation tonight with Jesse DeRosier. Jesse is a member of the Blackfeet Nation. He is a husband, a father, 
and he is a language instructor and has agreed to join us tonight. And Jesse, thank you so much for, for being here. And I look forward to uh, you and I kicking off the conversation. So I guess where I wanna start, Jesse, um, when we talk about the Bob, just like I did, I think it's always important to recognize that there is a history of this land that is way older than of course, 80 years. It's um, has a substantial part in your ancestors history. Um, and I just want to ask you, as a member of the Blackfeet Nation and somebody whose blood in the soil goes back for uh, centuries and centuries, when we talk about the Bob, what does that mean in context for you? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to just greet myself and or greet you guys in Blackfoot, if you don't mind, and then I'll answer the question. Okay, Great. so Greg. Uh, I just greeted in, in Blackfoot, you know, uh, the language that's home in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, the, the oldest language in this area. Um, but that's a great, great question on uh, what it means to us, you know, I know a lot of times indigenous peoples aren't included, but when we talk about Ball Marshall and how it neighbors Badger to Medicine area, Lewis and Clark National Forest, Glacier National Park and the Blackfeet Reservation in that area, our boundaries, our historical boundaries never stopped at the current lines that are drawn on maps today. You know, our historical sites and our um, origin sites, uh, I think Badger to Medicine is really recognized as that, but it extended throughout the Bob Marshall Wilderness area, throughout Glacier National Park, and throughout Lewis and Clark National Forest. Um, we are fortunate to have those areas undeveloped as much as they are, um, but obviously my people have lost some rights within that. But we've always looked at those areas as very special, very sacred to our people. A lot of our origin stories uh, talk about our time in the mountains and how we lived and traveled in the mountains a lot. Um, doing some archaeology work on my reservation with Tippo, the archaeologist said that it was around, um, I believe, 10,000 years ago when the Blackfeet stopped living in the mountain front and started to move more towards the plains area. Um, but even after that, we still utilized the mountain front for hunting, gathering, and medicinal purposes. Um, so what Bob Marshall Mil Wilderness means to us is basically it was our medicine cabinet for traditional healing. It was our grocery store for uh, hunting, gathering, uh, as well as a ple place for solace, you know, and a place to um to go back with nature you know the the wilderness aspect and in, in the trees and mountains is completely different than the prairies you know so i think uh, reconnecting into those places ties us back to our ancestral homelands in a lot of ways when you and i first talked you brought up that there's really not a word for wilderness in the language exactly you know when we look at the definition of wilderness, it's basically untraveled by man. Uh, and as Blackfoot people, it, much like most indigenous cultures, we never separated ourselves with our environments. We were very much a part of our environments. So to consider a, uh, an area without human contact, you know, was so foreign for us. So untraveled by man. But the fact that we were a part of it didn't mean that we were destructive you know we utilized it but we went by the system of whatever we take we give back you know whenever we took an animal we we gave prayer and tobacco whenever we took plants we gave prayer and tobacco um, and even today gathering roots and different berries people don't over harvest certain areas you know we always leave some for the animals as well as everything else to regrow so the concept of land being set aside and designated as nobody goes in there, don't disturb it. You know, this was um, very unusual. There's no word for that or 
that concept, you know, we utilized our, our nature and gathering teepee poles with the pine trees, um, using every aspect of the animal for the clothing and the hide for the lodges, the bones, you know. So we really were as much of a part of that nature rather than separate from it. Yeah, as, as somebody that is um, in love with the place, with the landscape, and somebody as somebody who has also been very passionate about the idea, I wrestle with also in my mind, understanding that wilderness is a Western construct, right? It was something um, that really came over from Europe with this idea that wilderness was something separate from man as a part of man. And I sometimes to contextualize those two things that I can love the idea that we have a national wilderness preservation system, that we have these places that, that may have been heavily developed if we had them on the side, and yet the troubled history that that, that, that yeah, uh, ignores native history on the land. Um, it also, frankly, ignores the idea of stewardship of the land because that way predates the land management agencies and their partners like the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. And um, I guess I'm not looking for you to help me with my guilt, but it's just something I wanted to share with you that I, I fight with that, that I love this gift of the wilderness preservation system that we've been handed. And yet I wrestle with um, sort of that dichotomy of, of uh, the, the challenges that forgetting about that history and also the fact that these were, were stolen lands for the lack of a better way to put it. You know, and that's, a, that's something to definitely be aware of. Um, I think we're at a very interesting time in history. Um, Native American people as, you know, our history with the United States government wasn't very great in the beginnings the tradings and things like that it started off great but then obviously assimilation policies colonization policies and things like that pushed um pushed other things to the side but you know the movements in the 60s uh in the 70s that really helped civil rights and uh gain a lot of that understanding back is really what help bring us to where we are today you know it wasn't until 1978 when my people were actually allowed to speak our languages and practice our culture with the freedom of religion act um, but with that there was a new awakening not just when, within indigenous people but you know non-indigenous people wanting to know uh, what the connections were like and what the true histories were you know and I think we're getting back to that that the earliest contact was that of interest, you know, and helping one another and learning from one another. Somewhere along the way, it got lost. But I think that indigenous people really hold a lot of knowledge to especially the landscape and our environment that can be shared and brought out more today. And it just comes out with conversation, you know, um, taking a step in understanding um, and working together to get those knowledge to get that knowledge from there you know um, we can't go back obviously and change any sense of history but we can learn from it and move in a more positive direction in the future so that's why i really appreciate you including just the indigenous voice into this platform here today well i i'm thankful for you joining us you know it's interesting you talk about the those rights coming back in 78 and now you're uh, sort of leading the charge on the language side of it. Um, and while this isn't directly maybe related to the Bob, I think it is. So talk a little bit about what you're doing with the language instruction and its role in preserving that language. Sure. You know, um, when I was a child, I was fortunate enough to attend uh, Pagan Institute. It's a Blackfeet immersion school. It was a dream that was co-founded by the late Daryl Kip, Daryl Robes Kip. Um, and he had a dream of teaching children their language again, you know, but this uh, reawakening uh, didn't just start from him. We took a lot of lead from what was going on in Hawaii and some of the islanders in regaining their language. Um, and it's been a movement that's been going on ever since for the past 30 years or so. A lot of indigenous people realize the importance of language because like I said, 1978 Freedom of Religion Act that was the end of the government boarding school system. And from the late 1800s to 1978, indigenous children were stolen from their lands and brought to boarding schools. My 
two of my great grandfathers actually attended in Carlisle, 1890. Um, but there, the, the belief was kill the Indian, save the man. Um, an assimilation, you know, they wanted to erase everything indigenous and indoctrinate them into a Western understanding of what it was. So there was a lot of displacement, um, distrust, obviously, with the government, but a lot of trauma that took place. And I think understanding our language and gaining that back, we gain a big sense of identity. And with that comes healing, you know, but if you look at any linguist, they'll tell you that language is the root to, that drives any culture, you know, and learning any language, any second language, your ability doesn't just open up um, with your grammar or your vocabulary, but it gives you a whole perspective of the universe from that culture's eyes. And there's no more, no more of an in-depth look than that of an, a language, you know. So understanding our connections with our environment, with our animals, with our spirituality, when you have a sense of it within the language, it's so, so much more rich, you know? Um, and we forget about that at times, what's, what's hidden in the language, you know? And inside the Blackfoot language as a verbal based language, the environment and nature is very much animate and alive, you know? In English, I like to say it mostly focuses on nouns, person, place, or thing, right? And the only action, the only animacy is coming from the speaker. Whereas in Blackfoot, it's a very verb heavy, verb based language. So with that, there's a lot more animacy and description within everything. You know, for example, the, the name for mountains, me stuckists, me stuckists, it means forced up or pushed up, you know? And if you think about that definition of one word, it's really teaching the evolution of mountains, how it started with tectonic plates shifting, you know? Um, and trees, meetees, they, they, they reach up as well. So with every word we have for elements of nature, there's a story and there's, usually sometimes a song that goes with them, but it's a connection and it's a deep understanding that took thousands of years for my people to master and understand. You know, we were very science-based in our learning and very observation-based in our understandings. So to include indigenous perspectives and language into wilderness, we have an in-depth look on all these new, all these plants and environment structures, features, and things that we see, things, things that we pass every day, maybe in Blackfoot, it means, well, this helps for fevers, you know, and somebody maybe never known that, but if you learn the word, you got that knowledge. Yeah. But taking the deeper look and understanding uh, how to use it, why we do it this way, why we do it that way, that can take a lifetime of knowledge, you know, but just having a basic understanding, I think, can help anybody. Um, but it's not just with Blackfoot language, all languages. The difference with Blackfoot is that's our backyard, you know, so we're directly tied to those environments, you know. Yeah. Our origin stories, like I said, are in those mountaintops, in those prairies where we camped. I mean, it's, that is the origin. Sure. So we're all not defined by one element of our life, right? So besides being a member of the Blackfeet Nation, you also wear a couple of other hats besides father and husband. Um, but I also know you wear uh, the hat of a veteran um, and uh, the same hat that my son wears as a Marine. Um, yeah. and if you could talk, uh, shifting gears a little bit here, about the role that time spent back in wild places for veterans, for veterans who are part of the Blackfeet Nation, what the place means and the role it can play for those who are coming back, particularly those who are coming back from theater that have been in theater and have seen action. Uh, if you talk about a little bit, that would be great, Jesse. Sure. Um, you know, if we look at earlier, you mentioned that the first designations of the Bob Marshall came in the 40s, you know, and if we think about what was going on in that era, that was just the end of World War I, getting into World War II. 
a lot of wilderness acts come about in the 60s. Um, but what sometimes is often missed is some of the people who were leading those charges were veterans, you know. Veterans played a big role in preserving outdoors and wilderness in this country. Um, and it's not for any reason. Um, a lot of veterans have found solace and peace in the outdoors. Um, and it's a way to reconnect. Uh, I want to quote the late, uh, he was an activist by the name of John Trudell. He said, as human beings, we're living in a world that forgot what it's like to be human, you know. And if we take a second and think about that, and we realize how far technology, how far capitalism, how far civil civilization has pushed us, you know, we're becoming more and more separate from our environments. You know, there was a time when my people would practically sleep on the ground with just some hide and other things covering them. Um, and that was a way of connecting. You know, we've lost our connection to our environment. And as veterans um, and people who, anybody who's experienced traumatic injuries or um, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, um, there's been a lot of studies that prove that the outdoors and just connecting people back into their environment has been very successful in alternative healing. Um, one of the organizations I've worked with, Vet Voice, they serve over 50,000 members nationwide. Mm -hmm. And the number one concern from all the veterans that they serve was preserving public land and wilderness land use for veterans. Um, and myself, I, I am a fourth generation veteran of the United States military. Um, historically, obviously, my people defended our homelands thousands of years. But in our Blackfoot culture, um, there's a healing aspect that comes before and after uh, an individual goes out into the war, war trail. Um, and a lot of these traditions stopped with colonization, but people are coming back to them, not just sweat lodges, but spending time in the outdoors, decompressing. You know, I, I know it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of studies that show camping for four days, reset your biological clock. But for myself, when I came home, you know, and I, I know most veterans can explain what it's like to come out of the military, you know, it's something like a, being a caged dog, being poked out with a stick and then let loose with your family. and Somebody saying, you're free now, you know, I mean, yeah. you kind of don't know how to act. Um, so going to the outdoors really is what helped calm my uh, energy down, bring me back down to peace. Um, and even today when I have stressful situations, it's oftentimes if I find the nearest river or stream or trees, you know, I just feel more calm. Um, but the outdoors that I seeked a lot of peace in was the same outdoors that my dad went after. And when he got out in the 72, my grandfather after World War II and his father. So um, the outdoors have played a big role in our healing as veterans. Um, and I know that we're not alone in that. And if there's any veterans struggling or listening right now, I highly recommend going into the Bob Marshall Wilderness or any wilderness or environment you have around your area. You know, there's a lot of peace and solace within that. Jesse, I want to thank you for starting our conversation off with such a dynamic set of perspectives on the land. Hope you'll stick around a little bit, but I also know today is your one-year-old's birthday. So we'll understand yeah. if we see you drop off here in a minute, but, uh, could go on for hours with you, but I want to be fair to our other guests too. But but such a great perspective. Thanks for thanks for doing that with us this evening, Jesse. I understand. Thank you all. It's been an honor. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to turn to our first in-person guest for one of these fireside chats. See if I can get him to into the into the frame here and so we can talk. Um so we're now going to move to a hike. Uh that I've been wanting to talk about in more detail ever since I was told uh, the story in just brief details. I'm joined now by Chris Peterson. Uh, Chris is a reporter uh, for the Hungry Horse News. He is an incredible adventurer, I will say, 
and an incredible photographer. As a matter of fact, Chris has uh, donated a beautiful photo he caught of a wolverine uh, in the wild. He photographed in, in the park uh, and it's part of the auction tonight. So those of you who want to see an, an, uh, an incredible photo of, of uh, I think he's going to show it to us right, right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's right there, up for bid tonight. Um, can you imagine being able to have that moment to get that capture of that picture? Uh, but Chris has donated that. It is part of the auction. And uh, uh, you still have a couple hours to get in on the bidding on that. But Chris, you did a hike uh, that intrigues me a lot. And this brings us to Bob. Um, you did a hike to sort of retreat, uh, sort of retrace, retrace or mm -hmm. recreate a hike that Bob did. Um, matter of fact, I think it was his only journey in what is now called the Bob. Um, and I'm, the missions. Yeah, yeah, and the missions. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that hike. Jewel. Oh, uh, well. I'm to come a little closer yeah, so sure. I can hear you. Sure. In, um, in 1928, uh, Bob was 28 years old, and he went from uh, basically Big Fork to uh, the Sealy Lake Post Office the hard way. <laughs> and um, so he, he goes up through the Jewel Basin, and then... Um, or what, what is now the Jewel Basin. Actually, I even think back then it was still called, it was it was the Jewel Basin. But but imagine there is no Hungry Horse Dam, there's no reservoir. And so he drops down to Handkerchief Lake and then he hikes along the South Fork to Spotted Bear. And then from there, he goes through the Bob. And, um, and keep in mind, he was averaging 30 miles a day. So, uh, and I think one of his longest days was 42. And the elevation gain on top of that was incredible. I mean, he was doing like, well, he, he might do nine or 10,000 feet in a, in a day. In yeah, because he was, because, because I mean, he could like, for example, so he goes down to South Fork, he gets to Big Prairie, and then um, he climbs the Flathead Alps in a day. You know, he goes up there and he climbs, I think he bagged like three peaks. I can't remember the names of them. Um, he goes to the Chinese wall, but he doesn't go the way we would think, you know, you come in uh, benchmark Indian point and you go up along the wall. He goes from Black Bear up and over Pagoda Pass, up the backside of the wall to Cherub Mountain and looks down. Okay. Well, there's no trail. There wasn't a trail back then either. I mean, there's no trail from basically from Brushy Park up to the wall and back down again. And some people have done it. I haven't done it yet. Um, but um, so my journey, basically, I covered as much as I could uh, in in spirit. I didn't, I didn't go up the back side of the wall. I went up the front side of the wall. And some of it was just because I wanted it to be as uh, photogenic as possible. And, and, and not only that, but just logistically, I I, I'm, I was 48, Bob was 28. <laughs> and then, and then to make a long story short, he goes up and over, uh, uh, he goes over um, Gordon Pass, down to Holland Lake. He goes into uh, the, um, the missions. He climbs two or three peaks there. And that was in like a day or day and a half. And then he comes out to the Sealy Lake post office and he mails a letter. I can't remember who he mailed it to, but he, he mails some correspondence. Or the, that's where they pick him up. Yeah. <laughs> and to give you some idea of his 30 mile uh, uh, obsession was that in one in particular day, he got, does 28. And so he does, he would do these things called uh, evening strolls. And you can see the, you can see the, 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 the whole, the whole uh, thing is on, on your website. Yeah. Yeah. So, you had to go back and probably dig into his journal, and and so yeah, I went what, back. What, what was the time like spent with his journal? Oh, uh, it was it was pretty cool. I mean, I mean, it's just it was just a it's just a list. But then you know, I'd read um, I'd read this book, a Wilderness Original, um, so I knew so I knew it was, you know a bunch of his uh, you know his history, um, and <coughs> excuse me, and and I did it in I did it in a little different way. Um, I went from basically the Jewel Basin, uh, the Camp Misery Trailhead, um, which is basically where he started. He starts at Echo Lake, but mm -hmm. um, and then I, <clears throat> I didn't, but I didn't start. I didn't start in the Jewel in the sense that I started in the back end of the Jewel. So mm -hmm. I drove a truck 
to Bunker Creek. And if you ever get a chance, um, Bunker Creek is nothing like the name. It is spectacularly cool and it needs to be a part of the wilderness system. So I park my truck at Bunker Creek and I walk back to um, Camp Misery. And then from there, I got a ride down to Holland Lake uh, and hiked back to Bunker Creek. So, um, so because part of his hike is now under the Hungry Horse Reservoir, you just sort of use the Alpine journey there from from Bunker right, Creek right, to the yeah. Jewel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The idea yeah. was to I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want to do twenty something miles along the Hungry Horse Reservoir. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That wouldn't be in the spirit of what Bob was. Doing. Yeah, and 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 if you ever get a chance, that's a really that's a great. What what led you to do this hike? Uh, it was the it was the it was well it was 2014, so it was what the 50th anniversary yeah, yeah. of the, of the yeah. wilderness hike. Yeah. yeah. So, favorite memory from that trip? Oh well, there's a oh well, I think one of the one of the saddest memories was when um, I uh, uh, <clears throat> I came up and over Sun River Pass, or no, I'm sorry, is that is that the right one? Yeah, Sun River Pass. And um, I was gonna, I, my, my goal was always to camp as high as possible if I wasn't like on the south one. Mm -hmm. So I got to Sun River Pass and I come up and over this little hill and someone had put a cross in the fellow's pair of boots there. Oh. And he had passed away. He didn't die in the Bob, but he was a, I yeah. later found out, yeah. you know, in his horseshoe of his horse and everything. Um, and it, you know, and it had already been a, like a pretty, pretty that the the hike through the Bob. Um, I did it the same time of year that he did, and it I think it rained or snowed like seven of the nine days. What was the time of year? It was the end of August, early September. Okay, it's late in the season. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but not that late. Yeah, shouldn't have been. <laughs> yeah, so but as we know, we can get snow. So it had snowed. It had snowed. It snowed on me and rained on me. It had been not a great day, and then to come up and over the hill where you're going to camp. And there's this cross and, yeah. and it, it was just a really poignant moment like you know sure. like you know and then you no know, there, there was other cool places like in brushy you know i think the thing about wilderness that i enjoy the most isn't so much the scenery or even uh, but the sounds and so i'm camped at brushy park and i don't know if you've ever heard mountain lions like you know you hear the typical but they they also have this really soft call Sounds just like a bird singing, hmm. you know, a bird call at yeah. night. And I heard, I got up in the middle of the night in Brushy Park, and you could hear them. They were like right behind, you, like right behind you. You could yeah. hear them talking to one another. Yeah. That was that was that was fantastic, oh, you know. Great. Or or you know, you come up onto a herd of elk, and you can you smell them and you hear them way before you see them. Yeah, that's, that's always a lot of fun. Yeah. So this isn't your only time in the Bob, though. Uh, from what I understand, it's how, how many nights a year would you say you spend either in the Bob or in the backcountry? Well, you know, this summer I spent a lot of time on the Swan Front because that, that's all. I, I'm trying to photograph lands that ought to be in the Bob or ought to be wilderness yeah. or, 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 or protected. So we spent, like we spent, uh, you know, Jesse talked about the Badger 2 Med. We camped up on top of a ridge in the Badger 2 Med, woke up the next, I mean, it poured all night long. And then we woke up and there's this, rainbow going over the whole thing I mean, as a photographer i was just like, yeah it was like a yeah. wet dream you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know and 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 then the, and then like just before we went to bed i mean we had grizzly bears walking below camp yeah. so that, that kind of so that you know and then um th this year in the bob we went uh because it was the 80th anniversary we went, we went to the north wall which not a lot of people go to yeah. you know so that was that's Still, still a disciple of Bob. You study the man anymore? Um, yeah, we, you know, occasionally pick up the books and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. but but um, I'm getting. I've done almost all the uh, trails in, in Glacier. Yeah, and so yeah, chipping away at the Bob. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, thank you. That story with us, and yep. and again, thanks for the incredible photo that is available on the auction, and and uh, and thanks for being our first in person guest for. Uh, these fireside chats. Well, we had a little, we had a little problem. We had a little technology. <laughs> we worked through our technology by by the simple solution of sitting in the same room together. Um, so now I want to turn to Lincoln Bromwell. Lincoln is the chief historian for the United States Forest Service, um, and have a little conversation about Bob the Man. We just heard a little bit about Bob 
uh, hiking uh, through what is now his namesake, if you will. Um, no idea how Bob would feel about that. Um, but um, he did that uh, hike while he was a Forest Service employee. And so Lincoln, why, why don't you, first of all, thank you for joining us from Fort Collins, Colorado. Glad you could join us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is uh, this is great. And hello, Montana. <laughs> so Bob spent his life as a civil servant. Uh, uh, he, he was maybe more complex than that, but in terms of his work day, he spent it as a civil servant. And, and a biggest chunk of that, I would say, you can tell me, was, was with the Forest Service. Talk a little bit about the time he would have spent in, in what is now the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex, what he was doing at that time for the agency. I think he, um, so he had kind of two stints with uh, the Forest Service. Uh, he started out as, which I, I really like his, his kind of story and background with the agency because he, he starts out as essentially like a seasonal employee. He comes and works uh, out, out of Montana and is, uh, he's in between uh, graduate school. So he's coming out in the field seasons and, uh, you know, he's got a lot of a field experience. Anybody that's read much about his life, he, he spent his summers away at kind of like a, uh, a, uh, uh, an upper New York uh, state kind of retreat uh, cabin, if you will, and spends time out in, in Alaska. I mean, he's very much like trying to go as far as you can get, basically. Uh, at that time. And yeah, he, he first comes to Montana working for uh, research and the research and development branch as kind of a seasonal employee and uh, really kind of a, a neophyte, if you will, um, to working with other people outdoors. And um, he spent a lot of time outdoors, but not uh, uh, doing a lot of work. Uh, and he does that in the in the uh, in the 1920s is when he's out there, like like late 1920s, and then he has another stint with the Forest Service in the late uh, 1930s, near the end of his life. And he works out in Washington D.C. Uh, that's his official posting, but he was probably setting records at the time for how much field time he was spending for someone <laughs> whose office was in Washington D.C., which is an amazing trick then and now, um, pretty admirable, um, but had two very different experiences and, and they kind of both relate to each other. I mean, he makes a lot of relationships uh, in Montana with people that become key figures in the agency, future, future chiefs of the Forest Service, future heads of research and development that create a lot of uh, connections for him and uh, provide opportunities both for him, the agency, and, and the Bob, really, um, and the wilderness system kind of later on. Yeah, it's, um, you, you mentioned something in a conversation we had the other day that I didn't realize. I, I knew in the 1930s when he came back and maybe had bolstered his uh, resume and therefore his influence, but even in his stint in the 20s, uh, if I have this right, correct me, that um, he, he contributed to something called the Copeland Report. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So here he was uh, a seasonal, um, and I was a seasonal employee, and uh, you know that kind of existence. Uh, I think it's uh, you didn't want anybody to know your name as a seasonal because that meant you broke something probably. <laughs> <And> <laughs> you were in trouble. Um, you you kind of stayed quiet. You know, just don't don't make any waves and. Here he is, um, he's publishing articles. He's writing for the Forest Service had a bulletin, kind of a newsletter uh, at the time. And he's advocating for things like primitive areas, what, you know, precursor to wilderness. He's, he's putting stuff out there and writing in a very articulate way and getting noticed by um, people there on the ground that recognize you know, kind of comically, he has no idea what he's doing cooking breakfast for anyone. Um, he, <laughs> he doesn't know how to, how to cook an egg, but he's articulately arguing for stuff that we're thinking about and we're feeling. And that kind of lead, you know, 
his um, his ability to do that and make an impression on people uh, creates uh, connections and you know today we'd call it networking but um, people knew who he was both through his father and his own experiences. His father was a very prominent uh, civil rights attorney in New York um, and he gets the attention of uh, a Senator Copeland who wanted a congressional report on public lands and particularly um, management of them and recreation because you know even in the, the late 20s they were they were finding gosh we, we've got this new public land system what do we do with all of it what, what is it being used for what do people want it used for you know and I mean in 1928 the park service was officially 12 years old um, Forest Service is officially 23 years old. That's really not much time for, you know, federal agencies to kind of develop. And they asked Marshall to write the section on recreation. And here again, he starts articulating very clearly and very forcefully for, we need these areas where we just don't develop them. We allow them to be places where people can go, go and recreate and do what they need to do or want to do, but there has to be in, in all the mix of, you know, ski resorts and lodges and trails and campgrounds and automobile roads and, and view sheds that there should also be a place for um, places to go and kind of get lost. Um, and, and, commune, soak in, or, or do whatever you feel like you want to do in, in a wilderness area, basically. Uh, so it's really fascinating that he has, he has that opportunity to write, um, I think at the time his quote was, it's the best forestry work I've ever been able to do. Um, he's yeah. really proud of it. I mean, he writes three chapters of this massive, like two volume government report. Um, wow. Um, at, at, as a, at a young age, um, I, what, what all he accomplished and, you know, his very short life is incredible. And, and, and you, you accomplished that by getting to some of it early. And here he is in the, in his twenties, in the 1920s, in his twenties, contributing to something like the Copeland report, um, uh, is pretty amazing. So he, he goes over to the department of the interior for a while. He continues to travel. Like you said, he was just, uh, and as Chris told us, he was a avid hiker, traveler, goes to Alaska, writes a book while he's working on his PhD at Johns Hopkins. Um, but um, as I as I read this, and I, there was a, a question in our Q&A again, what's the name of the book is A Wilderness Original. It is a great biography on Bob. But he goes and, and uh, you know, spends time in Alaska, writes a book, um, gives the name Gates of the Arctic to Gates of the Arctic National Park. Um, but he comes back to the agency and it, it literally was a tussle, as I recall, between the Department of the Interior and, and the Department of Agriculture fighting over getting Bob to come back. You know, the Interior didn't want to give him up when he came back in the 30s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, he had, he had been asked by um, John Collier, who was the um, director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the BIA uh, during the Roosevelt administration very iconic kind of person, very, very forceful kind of um, a doer, uh, got a lot of stuff done for, um, for that, that period. And he asked um, Marshall to come and work for him as the forester for, um, for the BIA, which, you know, coincidentally gave him a lot of access to work on recreation policy and advise, advise tribes, not just on silviculture and how to grow trees and cut them down, but also, hey, you want to leave this part apart? Do you think of, you know, do you want to designate these areas for recreation, for man different kinds of uses besides just growing trees and cut them down, which um, forestry as a field was kind of known for at the time. Um, and then, yeah, he works there during much of the, the depression years and in 19, um, I think it was 1936, uh, uh, the chief of the Forest Service, Gus Silcox, asked him, asked uh, Marshall personally, will you come back to the Forest Service 
and be the first director of recreation and lands. Um, we don't really have policy. We don't have a manual. We don't, you know, um, we, do, we don't really have anything in place. And he actually um, accepts without talking to his federal agency that he works for in the Department of Interior. And he actually accepts a pay decrease, like a, um, to come work for the Forest Service, because I think he saw the opportunity of, I could really shape an entire agency that's managing at that time, 188 million acres, as opposed to a much smaller footprint um, than say the Park Service. But when uh, the uh, when um, the Secretary of, of I guess when, I guess it was, yeah, it was Chief Silcox notified counterparts uh, in at the BIA in the Department of Interior, hey, I'm, uh, I just poached Marshall, he's going to come over. Uh, it did not go well. And in fact, the Secretary of the Interior, you know, called the Secretary of Agriculture. So Secretary Ickes, like a really famous person from the the New Deal and very close to Roosevelt. I mean, very politically connected says no. And <laughs> gets, gets in a shout, you know, matches with Secretary of Agriculture Wallace and they they go at loggerheads for almost a year. I mean, he doesn't officially come over to the Forest Service till 1937. And I think that's another great, um, uh, it's an interesting thing to put on your resume, but to have not be allowed by your employer to get to be poached by another agency, they don't want to leave you. Yeah. It's really amazing. Um, yeah. It's it's hard to put that on a resume, I understand, but gosh, what a compliment to a person. Yeah. And he comes and he comes back over and jumps right back in and, and probably even more influential in his role in the Copeland Report is writing those early, like you said, writing those early recreation policies, including the U regulations that sort of the precursor to what we think of as is some of the language in the Wilderness Act. Uh, he comes over and, and gets to do that, right? I mean, that's that becomes his role. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he He's given that charge of figure out policy and, um, you know, write it down, get it uh, get the agency to pass it and certify it. And um, kind of the evolution from an agency standpoint was um, in the early, you know, a decade and a half before, Aldo Leopold had been sort of uh, inf um, influential for suggesting, why don't we create a, essentially a primitive area, the Gila um, down in New Mexico, why don't we just leave it alone? Let's, let's draw a circle, you know, a box around it, not do anything. And, you know, in an, a land management agency, in order to do that, you have to write down some regulations that will allow you to, to make that happen. And they, um, the shorthand for them was they became known as the L regulations. And they they added, you know, over into the, till about 1933, they added, I think there was a total of about, um, gosh, just over 10 million acres that fell under that. And by 1939, that increases to about 15, almost 15 million acres. But there's a lot of wiggle room in those L regulations about what you can do. You know, you could put a road in there if you needed. There could be some kind of harvesting or grazing. Um, and the U regulations that, that uh, uh, Marshall writes in 1938, and that becomes like official USDA policy in 1939 was much, much more robust and kind of solid that protected these areas to the point that um, for the next, you know, 25 years, these areas were intact enough that when the Wilderness Act passes, the, these, these areas have not been compromised that it got them kicked out of the definition of you know, wilderness with a capital W after the Wilderness Act. So that's a real accomplishment to be able to write some some policy that has that kind of robust lifetime, I guess. Um, that sounds a little wonky and nerdy um, coming from an agency, but if you're thinking about, you know, protecting a landscape, which was his real goal, and just trying to 
how do we put our arms around it and not do anything to it? That's, that takes policy that takes, you know, you have to write stuff and that's, that's hard. And I think he, he had a real, um, you know, 10 plus, you know, years of writing that specific story, you know, with starting with the Copeland report so that a decade later when he's writing the actual regulations, he's been, he's just honing an ar argument and an idea that he's been working on for a long time. Yeah. And he's working, he was working on it in his private life too. And we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute about his, all the influence he was also peddling outside the agency with his, his uh, startup of the Wilderness Society. And, but you know, something else that strikes me about Bob is, is you dig into the work he did um, and how far ahead of his time he was in so many things, not just in sort of this idea of land preservation as a tool within the toolbox of conservation. But, you know, in this year we're living in, in 2020, where we're, we're sort of having a reckoning about social justice and uh, racial inequities and, and that sort of stuff working on that in the 1930s, uh, you know, in those regular, those early recreation policies, I know he was, he made an attempt to integrate Forest Service campgrounds in the South, like 20 years before the military was integrated. Um, you know, uh, and, and he, he worked at, uh, at, you know, sort of weeding out um, permit holders who were discriminating on the basis of religion. I mean, he was kind of, I mean, he was kind of way ahead of his time. And again, probably somewhat coming from his father's, um, you know, ethic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of fascinating um, when you read his story and you start thinking about, so what was he advocating for, you know, in these recreation policies and what was he pushing for? And we always think, oh, wilderness. Oh yeah, you know, and, and sometimes you get lost a lot of the other things that he's really pushing for and a lot of it was was economic equality um racial and religious equality and that is such an outlier at the time it, it's pretty amazing i mean for he really had a hard time with looking at the um looking at the park service and their um this you know the 20s and 30s was their great era of building these really um just beautiful, expensive hotels in that in you know national parks, the El Tovar and Grand Canyon, the the Awani, and that you know they were trying to cultivate a, a well healed um, clientele, if you will, and and Marshall really bristled against that and really argued that you know we should be we should be subsidizing a bus coming from the nearest urban area and busing up people that don't have cars to come visit this lodge or this recreation site. And he really pushes that. Um, you know, we, a lot of times we forget, we think of, um, you know, the 20s and 30s as being a time of, you know, this is the era of Jim Crow. And we, we see pictures of, you know, no blacks allowed, you know, colored only, you know, um, segregated, uh, um, segregated public places but there were at that time there were also just as many signs saying no jews served here also um you can't we won't allow you to to stay at this hotel if you're jewish and he had he had felt that in his personal life and he um or had experienced that and so he actually you know was fighting for and advocated um in these policies that there needs to be these areas need to be free of religious persecution from uh, racial persecution uh, and, and, uh, and economic equality, which talk about forward thinking and um, be, not being afraid to be alone in a wilderness, I guess, would be yeah. uh, the way I would think about it, both personally in the woods and personally in the policy realm in DC. He was not, he was not scared. No. So Bob dies as a young man, 38 years old, 1939. Um, and in less than a year, uh, the agency takes these three backcountry primitive areas and names them the Bob Marshall Wilderness. I mean, his influence inside the agency must have been pretty incredible for something like that to happen at what feels like light speed. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he, uh, I, I was thinking back to that, that time when he's a seasonal and he, he hangs out with, I mean, it's, it's there in his biography too, but he, he spends time um, messing up the breakfasts of, you know, Dick McArdle, who becomes uh, a chief, uh, Earl Clapp, who, who becomes a chief and head of R&D and, um, you know, a number of others um, that they're, they're all still around. Gus Silcox, when he passes away, this group all knows him and they know one another and they know the impact that he had on them, on on Montana, on the agency. And, you know, I, I know those primitive areas have been, you know, um, set aside already or, or had been proposed, but the renaming it as an honor, I mean, that's, that's something that uh, it just doesn't happen, you know, very, yeah. very often. Um, I think, you know, we have a Gifford Pinchot National Forest named after the, the founder of the foresters, but that's, that's about it. You know, we don't have, not every chief has a, a forest named after them or a mountain peak or, you know, the, those things aren't out there. Yeah. Um, so, and I think it, it relates to, to his big impact outside the agency as well, because something like that would take outside support as well. Um, yeah. And a close connection to Congress, which he had. So yeah, big outside influence. Yeah, I'm going to sort of pivot here and, and jump in at any point, Lincoln, you know, to his time outside the agency simultaneous to while he's working inside the agency. Um, in 1934, uh, Bob is attending a foresters convention in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, and is joined on a field trip with Bernard Frank and uh, Bent Mackay. And those who don't know Bent Mackay, he was the person who envisioned the Appalachian Trail, what would become the Appalachian Trail and an attorney from Knoxville named Harvey Broom. Uh, and as the story goes, I don't know how true this is, but there was a pretty animated conversation driven by Harvey Broom, uh, who was really quite frustrated and, and upset that this road was going to be built through what had been pretty much undisturbed Southern Appalachia, which is we now know as the Blue Ridge Parkway, and why nothing was being done to stop that road. And as the story goes, as I've heard it, is the, the, the conversation boiled over and the radiator boiled over. Uh, they were on a field trip at this Forester's Convention. And on the hood of the car, those four gentlemen wrote, um, I think Bernard Frank's wife was with them. Uh, they wrote the Articles of Incorporation of the Wilderness Society. Um, if, you, if you look at the Wilderness Society's history, it looks like it started in 1935, but that's when they had the first meeting of the society. But those four wrote these articles of incorporation. And here you had three foresters at the time. Bent Mackay was, a, I think, a forester for the Tennessee Valley Authority, actually, and um, giving birth to this, this organization, the Wilderness Society. And, and Bob um, funds that startup, right? I mean, and, and like you said, some of that influence that probably comes from outside the agency, how we end up with the Bob Marshall Wilderness, because here is a guy who help give birth to an organization that, um, you know, that still exists today working to protect public land. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you mentioned too, I mean, it's important to remember, he, he believes so much in it, he bankrolls it. I mean, he is the yeah. sole benefactor for up until his death. So from that time period that hike and writing out articles of incorporation till the, till when he passed away, he's, he's funding it. He's not only, he's not just, Oh, I'm going to sign on, and I'll give a little bit of my time. He's he's a driver. I mean, he's he's a believer in it, and that's that's a huge um, and leaves. Uh, I believe he he makes after he passes away, he leaves his money into like three different trusts, and I forget the name of it, but one of the trusts is actually um, structured in a way that the Wilderness Society can benefit from it. Yeah. Um, to further the society so yeah it's pretty yeah he was i mean yeah he he, he literally he wasn't like making a donation he yeah. was writing the early executive secretary what we would now call the executive director of the wilderness society was robert sterling yard um bob was writing his paycheck out of his personal account every week or every month however often he was paying him um and on the night that bob died he had actually been meeting with 
uh, Bob Yard's daughter saying, I don't think we're paying your dad enough. We need to be paying your dad more, which meant Bob needed to be paying Robert Sterling Yard more money. Uh, uh, but that night, Bob gets on a train to go from Washington, D.C. to New York. And when the train gets to New York, the, the purser found Bob dead in his in his birth. And, and um, but meanwhile, yeah, his estate goes on to support the continuation of the Wilderness Society. And from here, I'm going to start to talk about this is where I was going to turn to Bill Cunningham. Bill is, uh, has not been able to join us tonight. I think Bill's still probably hunting in the Bob. He was going to come out. But um, so Bob gives uh, plays an important role in giving life to this organization called the Wilderness Society, again, 1934, and, and funds it through his death and then through his, uh, through his estate after his death. Um, and the Wilderness Society, along with uh, grassroots efforts of a lot of organizations, including the Montana Wilderness Association and organizations all across the country, um, continue to fight for these ideas that, that Bob pioneered um, again, through his role as a, as a civil servant working for the agency and also through his, his personal uh, passions outside the agency. Um, their work uh, leads to what's called the Wilderness Act being introduced in 1956. Um, and that bill uh, ends up being rewritten, reintroduced, uh, redrafted 60 times um, over the next eight years until it finally passes in September uh, September 3rd, 1964, signed into law on September 3rd, 1964 by Lyndon Johnson. Um, but with no Bob Marshall, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say there's probably no Wilderness Society. And with no Wilderness Society, I'm not sure we ever have a Wilderness Act. Obviously, other organizations like the Sierra Club were, were also influential in working on the issue as well. Uh, but here we have this one man um, and his personal drive to to, to push this idea forward. So of course in 1964, when the Wilderness Act passes, it codifies what the agency had done administratively in 1940, which is federally designates the Bob Marshall Wilderness um, uh, under the auspices of the Wilderness Act. Uh, that act also uh, set into motion the steps it would take to grow what was now gonna be known as the National Wilderness Preservation System. Um, and what it would take, and what it would take would be an act of Congress. Uh, and there's a really important change in the original draft of the Wilderness Act in 1956 to its passage in 1964. In its original draft, um, the agencies, the land management agencies like the Forest Service would have to recommend an area for wilderness. And if Congress did not act within a certain number of years, then by law, that area would become designated wilderness. That's the, the way the law was originally written in 1964, and there's a, or 1956 rather, and there's a reason I'm telling the story that relates to what we all now call the Bob. So no recommendation from the agency means no chance at wilderness if the bill passes as it was written in 1956. By the time the bill is rewritten the 60 plus times and is passed in 64, that changes. Um, it changes to where the agencies are still charged with making recommendations, but the only way a place becomes wilderness is if Congress passes a law to the infer affirmative. They have to say, we are designating this land for the American people as wilderness. Um, and so why, why am I describing that difference? Well, that no longer meant that it required the agency to recommend a place for wilderness. Congress could act based on the passions of the local public. And that's how we get the first addition to what we now call the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex, and that's the scapegoat. In the 1960s through 1972, the Forest Service had had plans for a scenic byway, a highway that would have gone into what we now call the scapegoat country, uh, down out of Avando and Lincoln. Uh, and the locals in Lincoln in particular were not very happy about that idea and wanted to see this area left in its um, wild state. Um, and because there was no longer this mandate of this area being recommended, because it was not recommended in the forest plan at the time, um, the scapegoat wilderness passes uh, through the work of incredible people like the Montana Wilderness Association, incredible people like Bill Cunningham and all the citizens in Lincoln. We have the first addition to what we now call the Bob, and that's the scapegoat in 1972. The Bob would grow again in 1978 with uh, a wilderness act that designated the Great Bear Wilderness uh, on the north end of the complex. And now we have 
a complex that is 1.5 million acres. It grew again and for the final time, for now, um, in 2014 with the passage of the Rocky Mountain Front Heritage Act, which added um, the Birch Creek area on the Rocky Mountain Front to the Bob. And that gives us what we now today call the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex. I'm really shortening a story that would, I promise you would have been a lot better if Bill Cunningham could tell us uh, than me, but that sort of uh, influence of that tracing those steps from Bob being there when the Wilderness Society is formed, Bob writing these early U regulations, you begin to understand how a person can be so influential that their name is hung on a place, and a place that we now all affectionately call the Bob um, on this character who stands behind me here, um, how, how his influence was so great that not only do we owe him the place that bears his name, but we owe him this now 112 million acre National Wilderness Preservation System. Um, Lincoln, anything you wanna add to that that maybe I've forgotten or I left out that you, you could add to that influence he had outside the agency that I've missed? No, I mean, it's, uh, he, he did have a wide range um, of influence. I mean, he was, he, he wrote, um, yeah, he was active in, you know, those early forestry circles, societies, um, was friends with, uh, and famous for being able to entertain and get together legislators, uh, uh, justices of the Supreme Court, um, you know, heads of heads of agencies to come hang out in his place, you know, in D.C. Um, and it seemed like he was kind of a convener like that, whether he was in the Arctic Village in in uh, Alaska or, um, you know, as a seasonal in Montana or wherever he was at, he, he had a knack for that. And I, I think it just created kind of spheres of influence wherever he went. And I think he did his his best work trying to say, oh, these aren't my Forest Service friends. These are just, here's everybody I know that is or should be interested in land. So I'm going to throw them all together yeah. and uh, serve them wine and see what happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Lincoln, thanks for, for your perspectives and I appreciate it. And I'm glad you, glad you could be with us tonight. Um, when the Bob was pieced together over the, over the years that I just described for you, this incredible place, of course, the, the preservation of wilderness character fell uh, to the United States Forest Service. Um, for those who don't know, the Bob Marshall Wilderness Complex sits on three different national forests, the Helena Lewis and Clark, the Flathead and the Lolo. It sits on five different ranger districts, uh, Hungry Horse, Spotted Bear, the Rocky Mountain Ranger District, the Lincoln Ranger District and Sealy Lake. Um, and uh, those agency employees went about managing which is sort of an ironic word in wilderness, uh, what we call stewarding these places. Uh, but over time, it also became clear that one of the innovative ways to steward these places is to facilitate partnership and give life to partners that care about the preservation uh, of wilderness character, care about keeping access um, to these places by keeping trails open, keeping places wild by uh, working on weeds mitigation. And that's uh, where we get to the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation, the great place that I get to uh, come to work every day um, and follow in the footsteps of my next guest, Carla Belsky, who is the first executive director of the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. But actually, you had a role that predated executive director. Why don't you tell us about that start, Carla? Well, um, I guess I started as a seasonal with the Forest Service. Um, I worked for six years in the Sierra Nevada mostly in the Ansel Adams and John Muir wilderness areas. And I did some wilderness restoration projects as well. Um, so when I first came to work in Montana, I was hired as a seasonal with the Forest Service to start the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. And my first title was volunteer coordinator. And I was basically showed up in Montana. I'd actually lived here for a little while. Um, went back to California and then came back to Montana and I was handed a couple of files with some names and some phone numbers and <laughs> that's how we started. It was pretty um, it was pretty challenging at the beginning but um, it was just there was so much potential and so much excitement with just how much work there was to be done and how many people we could reach and get out into the wilderness. 
So this was 1997, do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, 97. So I don't remember all the details because it's been a while now. So, you know, I was in my mid, I was in my mid twenties and, you know, just loved wilderness and wilderness was my home. And um, I actually wrote my senior thesis on wilderness education and educating people about, you know, how to restore and to protect and to maintain wilderness. And so it, working in the Bob was just such an exciting thing for me to take on. So what was, what, was, um, what was your day like in 97? I'm curious. When I showed up. <laughs> yeah, what was your day? What would, yeah, it was, I just probably no such thing as an average day then, but what, 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 was, what was your work plan like in 97? In 97, it, it was just me. And, you know, I met a few people. We, you know, there was a very small board. Mike Daly was our board chair and he was, you know, let's just get out there and get work done. And we, I worked with a couple of therapeutic boarding schools who I coordinated some trips with. I had some Boy Scout troops that came out, you know, it was, I tried as much as I could to just sort of get people out into the wilderness and I made a lot of mistakes and we had a lot of challenging trips, um, but that was part of learning. And that was part of, you know, how do we get people out there and get them engaged in maintaining trails and, you know, having that wilderness experience. So it was, it was very challenging, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of just really, how, how can we make this happen? We need tools, we need money, we need all of this. And I started as a forest service employee and so I was limited with the tools that basically were left over at Hungry Horse Ranger District that they let me use um, and and I just had to grow from there you know yeah. so it was like okay we need to um, after my first six months of working for the forest service I volunteered that winter and started writing grants and working you know on fundraising and we did get a grant from the National Forest Foundation for $25,000, which was pretty much the seed money for us to start, you know, me being able to work for the foundation and having more fundraising capability. So um, we also developed the Challenge Cost Share Agreement with the Forest Service, which also gave us some funding. So we just had to start building from scratch. And, the, you know, there is just such amazing support for the wilderness and, you um, the Bob Marshall, and here comes my dog. She's gonna. It's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> it wouldn't be 2020 in a Zoom presentation without a without a pet <laughs> picture. So that's perfect. Yeah. So um, it was a lot of work, but um, you know, I did actually being a seasonal, and you know, I had a lot of wilderness experience, but I didn't have a lot of experience with running a nonprofit. So I actually went to a lot of Montana Wilderness Association board meetings in Kalispell and I learned sort of how to manage a board and how to how to do all that. Um, we had a great treasurer who helped me sort of learn how to do the financial management. And so there was a lot of learning that I did. I, I always say that I got my master's degree in the Bob Marshall because there was so much <laughs> that I learned as I went along. There's worse, uh, worse, th worse things to have a master's degree in, so. Yeah. And I got to go out in the woods a lot, um, which was great. And, you know, but there was a lot of things at the beginning, you know, our first tool cache was probably um, two garbage cans that were in this part of the Hungry Horse Ranger District. I don't know, there's this big complex back there. And we had a little closet and I put all our flaskies in one garbage can and put all our hard hats in the other. And we'd always have to pull them out to get ready for a trip. And, you know, but then we grew from there and, um, our board chair, Mike Daly, offered his old cabinet shop as our tool cache for a while. Um, and I had a volunteer, Russ Lucas, who started sharpening crosscut saws. And, you know, so everything just grew and it just took a lot of time. But um, it's it was sort of something that I was committed to to have happen because it, it was so challenging and it was so grassroots at the beginning that I just, you know, I had an opportunity to go work for the Forest Service at a certain point. I was like, nope we got to keep this going, we got to make this happen because it's just not quite together yet. And it's, yeah. you know, working with the different districts and the different wilderness managers, there were a lot of challenges with having them like, accept that volunteers were useful and that they were worth their time to help coordinate. And it, 
it really took a lot of that like convincing and you know yeah of course we had failures but we also had a lot of successes so it took a lot of time to build and it's just exciting to see how far it's come today so well my, my hat's off to you for for I, i've been through that sort of startup phase before and i know how hard it is and how easy it would be to throw your hands up and um and how easy it would have been to go back to the safe space of working for the for the agency instead of right Severing, and uh, you know, if not for your hard work and the hard work of the early uh, iterations of the board, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here today. The success story that we are, you know, the agency just rec uh, recognized uh, the foundation with their Enduring Service Award, which is just fantastic. And um, so, you make this transition from an agency employee in '97 as a coordinator to the first executive director in '98. What was some of the trajectory as it started to go, you know, when, when did you move out of the trash cans as the tool cache? And, <laughs> um, and I know, I know, like, for example, we've talked, you gave birth to Voices of the Wilderness, what we're here celebrating tonight. You, you didn't have to do it there as Zoom at the time, but, but right. yeah, it's even this idea, right? So. Well, and there was a lot of, you know, fundraising was a completely new idea to me. And so one of the first fundraisers, you know, we thought of was like, well, let's do a Bob Marshall calendar and let's get Monty Dolak to do it. And I called Monty Dolak and he's like, yeah, don't do a calendar because it only lasts a year. He's like, let's do a print. And so that was one of our first, you know, fundraisers was to bring Monty Dolak out into, uh, he went to Schaefer and spent some time out there and he produced our, I'm actually not sitting by ours. This is MWA's of scapegoat. I do have <laughs> I can take you guys back there, but maybe you get dizzy. Well, we actually, we, we actually have that, uh, that print uh, framed and matted by the Art Attic in Missoula. The Monty Dolak uh, Evening in the Bob is, is in the auction tonight. So if yeah. wants to go check it out in the auction, it's, it's still a fundraiser for the foundation. Yeah. And so, you know, art, uh, art is always, you know, it's something that I have a lot of passion for. And so the Artist Wilderness, Wilderness Connection was another project we started and it just, segued to Voices of the Wilderness with their, you know, having the artists go into the backcountry each year and being able to contribute back towards the wilderness. And so it's just with such a um, great, you know, I just knew it was going to be a great fundraising idea yeah. because it's art and people connect with art and, you know, looking at a picture of the Bob in the middle of the winter when it's snowing, it's just, I don't know, you just, I love it. Yeah. So, um, you know, other, the Mountain Film Festival, uh, Chris Miller was one of our board members at the time, and he brought that fundraiser up, and that has been something that I just really, you know, with us being based in the Flathead, it was something that we were able to reach out to the other areas in Montana, so we had it in Helena and Great Falls, and so to make connections with people in those communities, I just felt like that was such a great outreach, and it's so exciting to see that still going today. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, it's the, 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 the license plate, the license plate. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was an early thing to you. Uh, Sue Daly, Mike Daly's uh, wife helped me on that. And Andrea Brew was a friend of mine and, you know, sh they hike in the Bob all the time and she's a watercolor artist. And I said, what do you think about uh, it producing something for a license plate? And she's like, well, we were just in the Bob this summer and I have all these sketches. and. So she produced the beautiful license plate that um, I know brings in a good amount of money it does. every a, year to the a, foundation. So yeah. I don't know. I guess it was all about yeah. the art in wilderness. Yeah. You know, it's, I don't know. I think there's a lot of connection there. So, um, you know, and I do just want to say that a lot of the people who helped me along the way at the beginning um, and moving through some of the development of the foundation, you know, Deb Mucklow with Spotted at Spotted Bear Ranger District was a huge help. Patty Johnston, Rocky Mountain Ranger District, um, Gordon Ash, Al Koss, Fred Flint. I mean, all of those guys were really helpful in supporting the foundation and, you know, helping us get through the bumps in the roads and the challenges and the fires and the different things that happened. Um, so I really just wanna credit all those folks. And then some of our early staff, um, we had some great staff that worked um, Kurt Kress was my first intern and I was so excited to have someone and he was like, I'd go, he'd go to Helena and he'd go to Lincoln and he'd go to Sealy and he would just go everywhere. And 
you know, and then I grew from there and we had a lot of great seasonals. Um, I hired Paul Travis, who became the next director after me, Meg Killen, who is still associated with the foundation and you know, just so many great people. So um, really something I'm glad I stuck with and just so excited. Um, I had children, you know, while I was working for the foundation, which became hard for me to travel a lot. And, you know, I remember the um, National Trails Day where I took my son on the Devil's Creek trail project and it rained all day, but we had burgers afterwards and it was great. And, you know, it was just such yeah. a, such yeah. a, you know, great, great project. And I don't know. Anyways. Well, thanks for, th th thanks for being such a, a great foundation. You know, you talked about all the agency folks that you worked with that helped make this happen, but you, you did a great job of laying this foundation of how our, our relationship with the forest service still works today. Um, you know, in that sort of shoulder to shoulder way where, where we work in concert with one another. We're not just somebody who shows up to work on Forest Service land, but we show up to work with the agency uh, on a daily basis. And you're to be applauded for sort of charting an early path, because uh, if you don't get started on the right, right foot, you, you may never get there. Right. So. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, in the work I do today, there's still those challenges working with agencies and nonprofits that, you know, it's a it's there's different goals with the different, you know, with the nonprofit versus an agency. And it's trying to mesh those goals and work together for the common good. And it is a challenge. And I'm, you know, I, I think it's just, it's worth, it's worth finding, you know, the connection and the ability to work together for the common goal. So it's, Absolutely. yeah. You got any final words of wisdom for the current occupant of your chair as executive director? Um, you need to have fall projects that I can go on every year. Because <laughs> I still work, I work and I might, I'm really busy in the summer and I just want to go and you should have like, I don't know, alumni trips or just make me go on a project every year. So. Duly noted, duly noted. <laughs> Marla, thanks for sharing that, that early history of the foundation. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you joining us tonight. It's so great. Right. Yeah. Well, good luck and everything. And yeah. Maybe I'll join the board. I got um, recruited to join the board for many years. And I said, I can't just yet. I got to wait till my kids are, you know. I hear an opening. Up. And they're high schoolers now. They're teenagers. So I'm getting closer. So yeah. I'll, I'd love to join and um, be involved with such a great organization again. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks for what you did to get us rolling. Uh, thanks for loaning us your son during the film festival in Whitefish earlier this year. He helped <laughs> a lot so uh, we'll uh, we'll make note of those fall trips and uh, I'll also make note that you threw the door open for joining the board so that's great so I'm gonna, now I'm going to turn to our final guest tonight um, to have a conversation about the present and the future um, I'm joined by Leanne Martin the regional forester for the Forest Service for Region 1 the Northern Rockies Leanne thanks for thanks for joining us tonight and thanks for being patient Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, it, actually, the time's gone really fast. I've loved listening to all the different dialogues and um, the folks and their different views. So thanks for the invite. Yeah. So you and I first got to meet in Washington, D.C. when you were serving yeah. as the Director of Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers. Um, and, and so I guess I want to start there. What brought you first to, uh, to that role? What, what, talk a little bit about your personal history with wilderness. You know, um, how I got to be the National Director of Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers is, uh, it, it's, I don't know, it's one of those things I can honestly tell you, I never entered my realm of thought or possibility of um, having that as a career. Um, my personal connection to wilderness is, you know, I grew up and I just love the outdoors. And I think Jesse was saying how just being outside, how it can, um, rejuvenate you or recharge you or just, you know, reconnect you, calm you. Um, you know, I've just always had that. I've, um, and so just being outside, being outdoors, having that solitude. Um, my grandfather used to, never used to go to a church building, but he would go to the outdoors and he'd call it going to church. I mean, it was just that type of connection. Yeah. And so, you know, my, my background is I'm a forester 
um, and went through um, various, I think you know this, Bill, um, actually started in Northern Idaho, worked in Montana here, out, out of Libby, Montana, uh, where yeah. both my boys were born. Um, then meandered east, I thought, for a couple of years, but ended up in Michigan and Pennsylvania and then D.C., and it was really just an opportunity with, um, for those of you that may have known years ago, Joe Holtra. Um, I was a forest supervisor in Northwest Pennsylvania on the Allegheny. And he called me up and said, you know what? I've got an opportunity. Would you be interested um, considering coming in as the national director for wilderness and wild and scenic rivers? And I was like, you know what, Joel? I would love the opportunity. My kids, you know, Carla, you said my kids were at the age there that they were mobile and I was okay moving them at that time. Um, and I thought, what a fascinating opportunity to really nationally have that overview and be able to work with people across the country. I had managed wilderness as a forest supervisor in various forests or as a ranger, but I'd never had the privilege of just looking at the whole system and working with everybody with that. And so um, I jumped at the opportunity. I'm very fortunate Joel offered it to me. And Bill, as you said, that's where we met. And it happened to be right before and during um, the 50th anniversary. And so I had the privilege of a lot of things going on across the country and internationally um, with wilderness and celebration of the 50th. I even got the chance to, of all things in that role, which again, I never even would have dreamed of um, going to Russia to visit with them on what they would be equivalent to their big W wilderness areas and how they manage um, primitive areas and what that looks like compared to other agencies in other countries on that. So just a lot of um, just opportunities that uh, and very much fortunate happenstance to put me where I was at. And I loved every second of it. <laughs> Uh, it, was, it was great to meet you in that role and, and uh, even better to get to come to Montana and now work with you um, here in Region 1 and specifically in my case working for the Bob. As I think about the Wilderness Act and, and the one thing that um, holds true and the courts say it holds true is the, the role the agency plays in preserving wilderness character. Mm -hmm. um, those challenges have to be pretty great, I would think, whether whether you're a district ranger or you're a wilderness program manager or you're a forest supervisor or you're a regional forester. Um, what? How do you see the challenges today and how do you see those challenges evolving when it comes to preserving wilderness character as it's defined in the act? You know, it's fascinating because as I was listening to everybody else talking and starting with Jesse and then um, going through the history and Lincoln, some of the things you brought up, I was thinking um, a couple different times that, wow, some of those challenges have been, are still here today, um, that obviously were there years ago, even before it was the Bob Marshall or before we had some designated wilderness. And because of the foresight of a lot of um, people like Bob Marshall, you know, look where we're at. You know, as an agency, one of the things that, um, and in my role as regional forester here in the Northern region, one of the things that I am so thankful for is for folks like the foundation and our volunteers and Carla, you know, people like you that had the insight and the uh, perseverance to stay with it. And um, frankly, today to still stay with us, because you're right, it, it's not easy working um, and trying to find that mutual objectives and how to work through that. What I do find is that everybody has, a, when you talk about wilderness, they have their own personal values. It means something to them. So conceptually to want to preserve it and the character, that's a common objective that we can usually all agree on. And that's a starting point. Okay, yeah. and then how we go about doing that and what we can bring to it as an agency, working with partners, working with um, tribal nations, working with you know foundations, volunteers, that to me is the best way of um, preserving the, the wilderness areas and how sacred they truly are. And having people have the ability to go enjoy those and have the characteristics be now, but more importantly, be into the future for generations to come for you know my children and their children and um, being able to do that. Because we all know the population is growing. You know, um, the use is growing, the desire to get outside. I mean, of all years, 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, oh my gosh, where did people want to go? They want to go to their public lands. 
They want to have some place to go, which is phenomenal, but it has its challenges with it. And so um, I think, you know, you and I have talked quite a bit, Bill, is, you know, our objectives and, and the concepts, we all get wrapped around how we can make it all work. Just like you have challenges with the foundation on some of all of it um, this year with volunteers and what you could or couldn't do in the pandemic. Um, you know, but look what you're able to do with, with staff and how much we were able to do together still, even as we were working through those challenges is because we all have that same objective. Yeah. With that. So, um, you know, I, I, there's not a black and white to it. That's the other thing I've learned is, you know, the Bob Marshall with, you know, um, in Michigan, um, I, Nordhaus Dunes Wilderness, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it literally has beachfront along Lake um, Michigan as part of it. And it's a, it's a small wilderness area, but for that part of Michigan, it was huge. But you have wilderness characteristics there that you need to preserve just like you do in the Bob Marshall, but, but they're totally different. Yeah. So try, you know, valuing what's unique about the Bob Marshall compared to like a Nordhaus Dunes or even, you know, a Frank Church or, you know, another one here in the Northwest is something that you really have to take into account. Yeah, it's interesting that every wilderness is different, and yet every acre of the wilderness preservation system is kind of created equal, right? They, they yeah. all, we're supposed to sort of treat them the same in terms of preserving what made them worthy of being added to the system. You know, some of the, the wonky, nerdy stuff, the, the, the workaday stuff, the preservation of wilderness character, as I said, or, or programs like the Wilderness Stewardship Performance Program, that it's an agency, you know, a force or specific program. How do you see... Uh, partners like the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation evolving and continuing to help with with building on the great work we do to keep trails open or to mitigate invasive weeds uh, and, and playing roles in sort of, let's call it your workforce, if you will. We become an extension of your workforce. Oh, yeah. like to point out, that's all we are as an extension. We're not a replacement for, right? We're, we're in addition to, but how do you see that continuing to evolve? You know, um, part of where I see that, and, and you hear quite a bit now from the agency standpoint, the concept of shared stewardship or, you know, um, the term stewardship, stewarding wilderness, of course, has been around for ages on that. It's, I like the way you said it earlier. Managing wilderness sounds kind of um, different, but we steward wilderness. If I think about shared stewardship, to me, it's not an initiative, it's the way we are. And it truly is stewarding the whole together. So when I think about wilderness and stewarding wilderness, we have you know, the wilderness performance system, we have the wilderness, wilderness character monitoring, we have a lot of things and tools and, and models to help us try and measure what that looks like. But nothing replaces relationships, nothing replaces um, shared values nothing replaces just getting out there and enjoying what it really brings to us. Um, you know, the, the folks that the Chinese wall and outfitter and guides that um, take people there from all across the world on, you know, horseback, you can't replace that experience and that um, feeling that people get and the relationship we have with our partners and our volunteers. And so to me, it's definitely not replacing it's, building off of those relationships, extending what we truly all are working towards. Um, because it's not my wilderness, it's not the agency's wilderness. We have the privilege of stewarding it on behalf of the public. Right. And it is an honor and it's a privilege to do that. So we are in service to the public and their public lands and their wilderness. So it's really building on that. And there's challenges. I mean, um, we have some authorizations from Congress now, like with the Trail Stewardship Act, you know, it's a priority area. Um, how can we build off of that? I think there's a lot of work we can work, do together, um, but we have to do that together because I don't think any of us, the foundation or the agency or other volunteer organizations, NGOs, I don't think any of us as one entity will have it all figured out. Right. But I think coming and doing it together will continue moving in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. I think you put that perfectly, like, like the National Trail Stewardship Act, which created a pathway to do the work. And now the Great American Outdoors Act maybe hopefully creates ultimately the, the funding mechanisms that'll help make that happen, you know, 
we like to get work done for the agency, but most importantly, we love and find joy in our mission, which is connecting people to their wilderness heritage through service. It is great that we accomplish tasks on the ground, that we get trails open, that we cut, you know, 3,000 trees off the trail during the summer. But most importantly, we've connected 300, 400 volunteers that summer to this idea of a wild place and watching the transformation that some of those people have while giving back to their public lands is, is, is quite frankly, the great joy in our, in our work. And, um, and if, in, if in doing that, we also get to be able to help accomplish these other tasks with our agency partners, just all the better, right? So. Well, I think one of the things that, um, you know, our motto as an agency is caring for the land and serving people. You guys have heard that. You know, to me, I almost, in my mind, I switch around and serving people and caring for the land because you know, our job is to be in service and, um, and connecting people to the land and doing what we can so they can enjoy their public lands. And, um, and the wilderness is a, is a special experience and way to enjoy it, which is different than, um, you know, say an OHV area or a snowmobile area. And they're all very much sacred to whoever wants to use their public lands in those ways. And, and so just recognizing that there's a reason why people like Bob Marshall had the foresight he did in, in, our, in um, the Wilderness Act and all of that to set aside some of these areas for a different type of enjoyment um, and use and honoring that and respecting that. And also just um, recognizing that it didn't mean, I think Jesse was saying it, I loved um, listening to him and I, I, I definitely can't say it as eloquently, but just, you know, back with um, his people, he said, you know, it wasn't that we didn't use it or didn't go there. We didn't have a separate term for wilderness in their language because it not having something that was separated just wasn't something they thought about because they were all one. Right. They got out there and enjoyed it and used it and lived off right. it. Yeah, and you know, today it's it's um, for the larger society, it's it's something that we benefit from from a mental health perspective, like you said, in 2020 with the pandemic. Um, whether you go there or not, knowing that it's there is for some people. Here in Montana, probably more so than almost anywhere else in the country, having it there actually for providing economic benefits because of the number of people that come to Montana for our incredible public lands holdings or, or the outfitters and guides, that, you know, quite literally financially um, make their livelihood uh, on a resource as special as the Bob. It's it's plays such an integral role of our lives. We just haven't really contextualized it in the same sort of way that the Blackfeet people did living on the land, right. uh, you know, making it home. So. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I, I'm sure the foundation has been thinking of and Carla and others that, um, you know, 2020 has been, I mean, what a year, right? In so <laughs> many ways, <laughs> uh, yeah. but the amount and the number of people um, as I mentioned earlier, they've been out on their public lands enjoying them for all the reasons you just said, Bill, or for whatever works for them, um, has been astronomical. I mean, it's been used that we've never seen. We have people out there um, that have never been out, frankly, in the outdoors to speak of, and including in the wilderness areas. So, you know, one of our challenges I see is, um, you know, how do we help them enjoy their public lands, their wilderness areas, but do it in a way that's responsible and that um, they understand like what leave no traces or they, they know what it, you know, um, the bear safety. And, you know, some of those things that if you've spent your life outdoors, it becomes more second nature. But if you've never spent time truly out in the outdoors, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so how do you, you know, I think that's one of the challenges because I could, now that people have found the areas and who knows how, you know, the pandemic, hopefully, you know, how it plays out in the near future or long term, but people want to get outdoors is such a wonderful thing. I mean, that's what you want, right? That, that's great. And there's challenges with it. So how do we, how do we work together with that? I yeah. don't know, but um, I know. Definitely education, for sure. Absolutely. On that and, um, and reaching the various folks and then. I think it's a great opportunity for um, growing that network of volunteers and people that want to help with the foundation and help us and, and do a lot of that work too, because 
they're now seeing it for the first time. Yeah, it's, I've heard it said that we're seeing recreation use this year that we weren't expecting for another decade because the pandemic created that change. And, you know, it, it comes at an interesting time. Last year at the National Wilderness Workshop, the whole theme was turning the recreationist into a steward. Um, and I think you're right. This, all of this, the challenges that are created by this new public is that we need to educate them on, on the ways in which they can minimize their impact on the land or on the, the idea of wilderness. The opportunities are it's a whole new community of people that we can introduce to giving back to their public lands, right? right. Um, and I think I think that's the challenge. And and, and honestly, I think the the I'm going to say the slightly more nimble nature that NGOs have over the agency, it's a role that we can play because we 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 maybe can move faster or we can pivot um, in ways that, that that's hard for an organization as large as the Forest Service to that, that an NGO can play that role and with, and hopefully it can play that role for the Bob. So. Yeah. Yeah, Carla said it very politely earlier on some of, some of the challenges working with the agency. <laughs> I thought she walked a fine line there for sure. Yeah, it's challenging for us some days, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Leanne, final thoughts uh, as, we, as we think about this year as the 80th anniversary of the Bob that you wanna share with the audience? You know, the one thing I, I would be remiss in um, if I didn't say it is, you know, it, it with the audience here, but definitely for you, Bill, and, and Carla is, you know, the founder, just I, how wonderful and how grateful we are to have the foundation, to have the relationship working in partnership, to have folks like you, Carla, and the folks you named have the foresight to stay with it and build the foundation. Um, because it is exciting. I see it's growing. You know, Bill, you mentioned you had the, the Chiefs Award this last year on, um, for the service and everything the foundation has done. And, you know, it's just never ceases to amaze me that when the challenges that we may be faced with that we can pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, we could use some help here. And I know the folks out there on the districts and the forest do it, um, your folks do it. And people are just like, okay, well, let's, let's see how we might be able to work together and how we can help each other. Um, that says a lot about you and the foundation the, and the folks that you um, have brought in and just the, the passion and dedication. So just a big thank you because we could never do it without any, all of you on that. Um, and we wouldn't want to do it without you because it's for you and for everybody, just like you said, making that connection and stewarding this wonderful land that we all just treasure um, because of the man that's behind you looking over your shoulder all day long. <laughs> keeping his eye on me. He's keeping your eye on me on that. So, um, so yeah. just a big thank you because I know it takes a lot of work um, behind the scenes to make it all go um, as well. And all the fundraising and all the different things there. Um, it may be a little smoother and look a lot different than what you did, Carla, but I have to tell you that there's still a lot of challenges out there. I'm fully aware of that. So. Yeah. I don't yeah. think Bill's bored. I guess I'll put yeah, it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I barely got settled in here in Montana and here comes a pandemic. Um, so, uh, but it's been fun and, and just the incredible staff here that that uh, has, has made it just such a joy and the culture that, that Carla and those that came between her and myself the boards, uh, the people that have served over the, on the board for, for 23 years now, um, the relationship, Leanne, with the agency, like you said, um, you know, we don't always agree. We have different perspectives, but because we work in this, you know, sort of side-by-side -side role that even when we have a different perspective on things, we always find a way to work through it and we always find a way to be stronger for it and therefore leave, uh, hopefully leave the, the wilderness uh, for those who come after us. And, and, and hopefully in my case, I can leave the foundation for those who come after me and, uh, and continue in this incredible um, journey we've been on. But I, I, I want to thank uh, Jesse, and Chris, and, mm -hmm. and Carla, and Leanne. I want to thank you guys all for joining us tonight. This was, was just a great conversation. I, I've been watching the numbers. And I'm glad so many people stuck with us through this uh, this fireside chat. It's been uh, it's been great. So I just want to say thank you to you all. Um, and at this time, say thank you to our, our incredible community that supports us. A reminder that we are now 45 minutes away from the auction closing. So uh, get your final bids in, uh, get on the website and buy the last of those raffle tickets. Um, 
but just a, a huge thanks for the support. We've had a great, a great year and a great week, even fundraising uh, for the organization. Um, uh, and uh, yes, thank you, Shelley and Lincoln. You too. I think I think I maybe left you out on that. Thank thank you, roster there. But but uh, it's just been great having you guys here. But thanks thanks again to our incredible community. Thanks to the staff here at the foundation, uh, Rebecca, Allison, Meg, Sue, the incredible board. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us for for uh, what's been a great Voices of the Wilderness. It's been fun that it's lasted two weeks and that we've had three of these fireside chats and they've all been very compelling and, and great conversations. And uh, thanks everybody. And these will be available on the website. We are recording these. And so if you wanna pass these uh, along to your friends, be, uh, be sure to do so. And again, thank you all very much. This has been great. And all, everybody have a great night. Be safe, be healthy. Thank you. Bye y'all.